Don't remember the past? Does that mean you're condemned to repeat it? What does our country's past tell us about our present? And how can it help us imagine a better future? This week, two leading thinkers on the tricky challenges of democracy. What are the best tools and even the best words we can use to create a better future? That's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, a place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. He started fighting white supremacy back in the 1980s in the militia country of the U.S. Northwest, and he's been a warrior in the struggle to advance racial justice ever since, building awareness, offering solutions, and leadership, along with some pretty transformative ideas. He's even been called by someone one of the most brilliant humans around. <laughs> now Scott Nakagawa is continuing his landmark work analyzing and creating strategies to counter right-wing movements as a Soros Equality Fellow, and he's producing an anti-authoritarian playbook that draws upon the work of anti-right-wing researchers, scholars, and activists all across the country to create a set of training modules and educational curricula. He is also a senior fellow at Race Forward. Scott, welcome back to the program. I should say you're an old friend, and we've been having these conversations <laughs> for years. Yep, decades. Um, I almost wish we didn't have to keep having them. <laughs> and we could talk about something else. Yeah. Talk a bit about where you started and where you are now. What the heck has happened and what hasn't? Well, um, where it comes to fighting the right is concerned, um, my story starts in 1988 in Portland, Oregon, where I was a resident at the time. Um, a man named Mulugeta Sarah, an Ethiopian immigrant who was a student at Portland State University, was murdered by neo-Nazi skinheads in the city. Who, they beat him to death with baseball bats and kicked him until he died. That incident was just, you know, it shocked the city that such a thing could happen in supposedly liberal Portland. Um, but we quickly learned um, that the people who committed that murder, who, who included, by the way, a homecoming king and someone who was the front man for a popular band in the city, that they were just the tip of the iceberg, that there were many neo-Nazi groups um, in the city, that the white nationalist movement um, in the U.S. had targeted the Northwest in what they were calling the 10 percent solution or the Northwest initiative, um, believing that because we were a very white part of the country with a very white supremacist history, that we were ripe for the picking. So it was really about the Klan rebranding itself, recognizing that its time had come and gone, and that in order to be able to uh, build a base again in the country for the politics that they represented, they needed to radicalize themselves further, and um, that's what they did. They made investments in the Northwest, they moved assets there, including neo-Nazi intellectuals, in order to build a movement from the ground up, particularly involving young people who were in the alternative music scene in places like Portland, feeling disaffected and um, as if they were um, not fitting in. You know, they were going to be the first generation of young white people who would not be as successful as their parents had been in the generation before. And so they exploited that anxiety. And today, not so much has changed. But just to touch on the history for a second, people may think white supremacist history, Northwest, Oregon, isn't Portland kind of a liberal culture place? Well, people think that about Portland and about Oregon generally because there have been many populist movements there. But um, Oregon was originally founded as a whites-only state. It was founded actually as a territory that said that um, people of color, and particularly black people, could not migrate into the state of Oregon, into the territory of Oregon, um, in particular in order to try to avoid um, black people and Native Americans getting together and mounting a revolt right, against these white settlers who would have then been in a minority. Um, Oregon is also the state that uh, in its uh, founding years um, terminated more tribes than just about the rest of the country put together um, and um, excluded black people from being able to immigrate into the state for a very long time afterwards. Those laws stayed on, on the books until the 1920s and dictated a pattern of migration, mm -hmm. right? So skip forward to today and you look mm -hmm. at the headlines. There's a lot of activism by an organization called Patriot Play Prayer as mm -hmm. just one example. They've been wrecking the offices of the international workers of the world. They've been disrupting mm -hmm. DSA meetings and ISO meetings. A lot of the same stuff. Yeah, a lot of the same stuff. 
It never stopped. You know, from 1988 till now, people imagined there was a kind of a time in between in which uh, white nationalism sort of went away. But the reality is they've always been there, but organizing underground. Mm -hmm. So around 1996, when Timothy McVeigh, um, as you know, the, as a Christian patriot, uh, committed that horrific bombing of the Oklahoma City um, Federal Building, the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Um, the federal government basically forced the white nationalist movement underground because they finally recognized that they themselves were being threatened by this movement. And um, underground, they began to organize in a very different kind of way on the dark web, on these websites that we now know about where they've been very active all of this time, but they were mostly disaffected from politics. Mm -hmm. In 2016, however, when Donald Trump began his presidential campaign, he really made a direct appeal to those folks, mm -hmm. right? And kind of brought them out of the margins back into the mainstream, and now we are facing And this. that's what we're seeing. So your work now at Soros and at Race Forward is to glean what you can from your history of work Mm -hmm. with relevance to the future. And one yes. of the things you're doing is looking at a film that you released years ago uh -huh. about um, what democracy looks like. Mm -hmm. Take a quick look at it today, and then we'll talk about it. Here's a trailer. Much of the disruption in our society is occasioned by economics, good economics. Power elite seek servants. So send across the border, bring in the people to do the stoop labor. Economy gets bad, no longer seeking servants, seeking scapegoats. The economy is bad now. So they're looking for some scapegoats to send out into the woods to die. Because each and every one of you has a deep and abiding love for this country, our heritage, our values, our freedoms. He started out as a Nazi and then a Klansman, both of which were political movements clearly associated with authoritarianism and racism. And he ended up a political candidate in a three-piece suit and a tie, a facelift, a makeover, physically and politically. Duke wasn't an anomaly. That's the conventional wisdom, that Duke was somehow merely a, a byproduct of the strange swamp-like politics that prevail in Louisiana, that, you know, he could be explained by the kind of water we drink down here or, or the contaminated oysters we consume. But that's not true at all. I think that instead of us being off the map, we were, in a sense, prefiguring and anticipating what was about to happen in national politics. We have more Border Patrol now stationed at the border. They're extremely confrontational. There's all kinds of like surveillance cameras and dogs. It's just a horrible reminder of how the border feels like a prison. It's completely been militarized. Proposition 187 asks voters to remove basic services like public education and health care from undocumented immigrant families. And I think people say, if you're not white, then you're not an American. Well, they got something else coming. Because most of those people were immigrants. You know, the only Americans are, are the Indians, you know. This isn't really about immigrants. It's about the changing demographics in this country and how it really scares some people. You know, don't try to, to characterize this as if it's not racially motivated. On election day, vote no on Amendment 2. Amendment 2 is very detrimental, to, not only to the, the gay community, but also to the minority community. And when we were fighting against Amendment 2, we were fighting it because it takes rights away from them and us. I think gays and lesbians were the target of Amendment 2 for one somewhat a cynical reason, to raise money for conservative groups. And Amendment 2 brought in a lot of money for conservative groups. I am just so grateful to God that the Supreme Court has said you can't put people's human rights on a ballot. So, Scott, I mean, that was 1997, talking mm -hmm. about initiatives in Portland and in California. Mm -hmm. Your new work is making the point of how uh -huh. contemporary this is, yeah. but it's really stressing the learnings. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned a lot of things. The very front end of that clip um, uh, makes the point that when the economy is bad, it is often the case that reactionary movements rise. What we have learned since then is that there isn't really a correspondence between those things, that all kinds of anxiety can cause 
you know, reactionary movements to rise, uh, sudden waves of automation, for instance, or demographic change, which seems to be what's dictating that um, kind of anxiety rising among the white population in the United States now. Because we always, people always point to, well, if it was just about economic insecurity, yes. why do black women, the most insecure, vote more progressive than just about anybody yes. else? So, you know, of course, um, we want a fairer economy, but simply making economic appeals to people is not enough. We need to deal with the underlying cultural issues that are driving people to revolt. And in this case, I think one of the, the probably the pr most important is demographic change. And um, we need to jump in and start to tell a story about that that's very different than the stories that have been told so far um, in order for people to make sense of it and to accommodate it in a kind of way that embraces pluralism as opposed to this notion that if one gains, others lose. Well, so what's the story? Haven't you been trying to tell this story for 30 years? Well, we have been trying to tell the story for 30 years. And, um, you know, I think lately people have become much more aware of the importance of narrative. And so I think we are in a moment now when we're beginning to start to think about how do we tell these stories differently, right, in ways that help us to look at the future and embrace the future. Fascism, of course, being about just looking at the past and thinking of the future as no future, right? Um, that the only alternative is to return to an imagined past. And so we need to start to imagine a future in which people can see themselves thriving and living well. Let's talk about a specific example. You've got the Trump administration talking about tariffs with China. For mm -hmm. many people, they're being, of, of Trump supporters, are being hurt by those tariffs. Yep. But if you listen to them, you hear them say, but I like that he's sucking it to China because mm -hmm. China's going to destroy this nation. And if we're going to have a future, someone's got to stand up and he's standing up. Mm -hmm. It is looking back, but it is looking, it is a future vision of us stronger against China. Well, it's looking back to a time when the American empire was much more robust in the immediate World War II period when we dominated the world and imagining that we can do that again simply by, you know, uh, imposing tariffs. But, you know, this story about, you know, like if we just sock it to China is one that we have been caught in over and over and over again. When we think about, for example, the civil rights movement and advances made in the, that period of time, what happened immediately afterward was that white Southern Democrats started to turn to the Republican Party, right? And they said, if they can join our union, then we don't want them. If they can have welfare, fairly, fairly uh, you know, participate in welfare programs, we don't want those programs. You know, if they can um, uh, send their children to our public schools, our public schools, then we don't want those public schools. We have seen this kind of rejection again and again and again. And it's not just happening here in the United States, it's also happening in Europe, where you see some of these um, liberal democracies in Europe that are saying now, as people from around the world who have been exploited by these economies for centuries are coming to their doorsteps as refugees, they're saying, if they're going to come here, then we don't want any of this. We, uh, if the democracy is the open door, let's close it. So we would rather have no social services, no public school for our kids, no public health care, if those other people, different skin color, mm -hmm. different, m we might have to share with them. Yeah. So how do you speak to that? Well, you know, I mean, I think we need to start to um, talk about how we are connected to one another, right? So, you know, on our side of the issue, I think what we need to look at, and this um, videotape from way back then tried to make this point, um, that each of the different kinds of bigotries that the right exploits, right, these soft entry points like homophobia, you know, at a time when you know, no one could imagine that um, something like same-sex marriage could be a reality. Um, Misogyny. Women yes. are going to take your jobs. Exactly. Each of them is a kind of Trojan horse, right? They exploit these bigotries and they use them in order to educate us about rights. So in the um, years that I worked primarily in the LGBTQ movement, you know, they made this uh, appeal. They said that gay rights are special rights. They are, in fact, the conferring of civil rights on groups of people who don't deserve them as though civil rights are something that are earned. They would say because of generational, intergenerational poverty, because of being able to um, de demonstrate a historical pattern of exclusion, and then make the point that white men don't have civil rights, right? Because you can't prove, them about, prove that about them either. And so it's, you know, that kind of Trojan horse kind of way of thinking that gets us to think us and them, us and them over and over and over again. And Asian Americans are going to get more and more targeted, it seems oh, like, yes. in this context. And we see an incredible increase in anti-Semitism now. Um, anti-Semitism, which people should be very, very aware of as a really important radicalizer of right-wing movements. Give us three things in your anti-totalitarian toolkit that we can or could do. Well, first of all, I think what we need to do is we need to disrupt these movements by exposing their leaders and their real agendas, right? We need to be very explicit about that. We also need to diffuse some of these tensions by um, 
not falling prey to these kind of binaries, these us and them binaries, but to really talk about what communities as a whole need. And as we do that, we need to compete more effectively for base with the right. We need to look at who is their immediately projected base of support, the people they're trying to recruit, and we need to compete for those hearts and minds by speaking to the anxieties that those people are experiencing with compassion and try to win their loyalties for our side. So support groups that you see doing that where you live. Yes, At absolutely. least for starters. Scott Nakagawa, you can find more and links to his work, past and present and future, at our website. Thanks. Democracy, is it a noun or is it a verb? That's just one of the many questions author and filmmaker Astra Taylor asks in her latest documentary and a new book. Reflecting on a word even she says she hadn't paid much attention to, she delves into ancient Athens and travels the modern day US and Europe talking with people who are reckoning with democracy's racist, sexist past and pondering its failure to address inequality while sort of reimagining some possible alternatives. At the end of the day, she sums up her investigations in what I think is the perfect title of the book, Democracy May Not Exist, But We'll Miss It When It's Gone. Astra's film, What is Democracy, was released this year by Zeitgeist Film. The book's just out from Metropolitan. Astra is also the author of the best-selling The People's Platform. I'm happy to have her on the show. Hi, Astra. Hey, thanks for having me. So, democracy, you say at the very top that you weren't that interested to begin. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a word that really inspired me. So I, you know, I spent my 20s in the aughts. So I was, you know, 20 or 21 when 9-11 happened. And so the way, I heard the word often uttered by George W. Bush saying he was going to bring democracy to Iraq and Afghanistan. We know that that didn't happen. And so the word had this really hollow, tragic quality, right? It was not a word that inspired me. So words like liberation, equality, revolution, socialism, those were words where I would wake up. And I felt this disappointment. And yet intellectually, I, I, I know the word matters. And that was in the back of my mind for a long time. The fact that this was an important word I didn't relate to, but it was actually during 2011, the wave of movements, calling for real democracy, so from the Arab Spring to the movement of the squares in Europe to Occupy Wall Street. And so people were gathered and chanting, you know, we want real democracy, this is what democracy looks like, that I thought, okay, it's time for me to interrogate this word and my ambivalence towards it and, and to figure out what democracy, you know, means to me. All right, so hence the movie, What is Democracy? Here's the trailer, take a look. For me, this project began with the question, what is democracy? And I quickly realized it's not something that's ever actualized, but always something that is in motion, a kind of ideal we're reaching towards. But in practice, everywhere you look, democracy is in trouble. Progress can go into reverse, and terrible things have happened in the name of democracy. Yes. It's been so abused and so misapplied, you know, compared to its original meaning, which means the power of the people, the government of the people. But so many have fought for the realization of a true democracy that in a way it's important not to uh, abandon the world. Right. And we also need to think hard about what that word even means. Yes. You see Sylvia Federici there, the great historian of the commons, feminist, eco-feminist and more, um, talking about the people. Mm -hmm. Did you come away thinking democracy is about the people and there is such a thing as the people? It's been pretty hard to get even women inserted into our notion of the people. Yeah, it's really interesting, that question of the people. So I think this is, so what I thought was democracy's sort of hollow quality, right, this vagueness, now I see as this ambiguity that's actually really powerful. So. I quite like the ancient definition of democracy, which is the demos, the people, rule or have power. So that's kratos, right? And what I like about it is that this idea of what or who the people is can always be imagined, reimagined, reinvented, and then how we rule is also up for debate, contestation. So it's this concept that can evolve and change over time. You know, obviously it began in a very truncated form. 
you look back at ancient Athens, for example, or look back at the founding of, of this country, um, the people did not include everybody. But so I think this, this, there's this conceptual problem, who the people is, but also the fact that over time, those who have expanded the people are precisely those who were outside of it. So women who weren't fully enfranchised, fighting to be included, you know, former, uh, formerly enslaved people fighting to be recognized as full human beings. So democracy's motor, paradoxically, is like always from the outside, moving towards the inside. And, you know, part of why I wanted to make this film and, and write the book was to sort of implicitly just put that, that dynamic at the forefront, right? Democracy is not just this idea that these founding fathers had and, you know, we're like living out their perfect plan. Has it ever been true? I mean, is that arc of history, the people from the outside, expanding the populace, expanding the notion of the people, expanding the notion of what it is to rule. Has it always moved in one direction? No. Because yeah. it doesn't feel like it's moving in that direction now. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it doesn't, right? I mean, it doesn't feel like it's moving that direction. And that's the thing, as I said in the, in the scene you just saw, you know, progress can go into reverse. This is not some sort of linear thing where we're just moving towards a more perfect union and or we basically have it figured out and we need to like sort of tweak things on the margins. So I think that that's what I wanted to get to with the title of the book. Democracy may not exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone. What I'm speaking to is my own you know, ambivalence as a left wing person. Right. This is not democracy. We live in an oligarchy. We live in a world where political and economic power is held by a tiny number of people and you know, lots of statistics back this up and lots of studies show that regular citizens have almost no say over policy, right? So we don't live in a democracy. At the same time, we don't want to be too glib and discount all the progress that's been made, the democratization that's happened. And so both projects try to live in that tension. So as you come away from this, what is your sense of like, where is the greatest urgency around actions, and then I want to get to this question of noun or verb, because that's another important thing. Yeah. Uh, Jean-Bertrand Aristide of Haiti always used to say elections aren't democracy, they're just the taking of the temperature yeah. of the democracy, how healthy is it? Yeah, I like that. You know, we live in a very politicized moment, so I began this project, I wrote the proposal for the film, so in 2013, which seems like another era, right? So the book, you know, does not really focus on this current moment in a news-driven sort of way, right. neither does the film. It's saying the problems with our political system go back much further than November of 2016, right? right. Um, and let's take this this longer view. Although um, they do help us think about this moment. Yes, but they try to help us think about this moment and sort of what what have been some of the problems that got us into this 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 mess. Is it as simple as capitalism? I mean, you would think a system that puts the majority in rule yep. over a minority would not have a society where a minority, a tiny yeah. one have all the assets and the resources and all the control. I mean, I 100% agree. So I think that is the underlying thread of both projects is the role of capitalism and the fact, I think, you know, I say in the introduction, the challenge of our time actually is expanding democracy from the political sphere. Yeah. So this idea of enfranchising everyone to the economic sphere. The biggest threat of our age is capitalism, which concentrates wealth, concentrates power. That's antithetical to democracy. Post-1989, the idea was that capitalism and democracy are the same thing. This is a, the idea I grew up with, mm -hmm. right? That I was told, I didn't believe it, but you, you were told that if mm -hmm. you didn't believe it, you were silly. Um, but now those are splitting apart. And so what I encountered while making the film was that there are actually a lot of young people who are coming down on the side of capitalism. That Trump supporters, the young Trump supporters I met, they don't actually dress themselves up in the rhetoric of the people. They talk about the fact that they want to achieve the American dream. They mm -hmm. don't care. One mm -hmm. girl says in the film, I care more about the American dream and that ability to climb the democracy. Then we see another movement, which is the movement I'm very excited about, which says, well, hold on, we're on the side of democracy. And if we want democracy, if we want political equality, we're gonna have economic, we need to have economic mm -hmm. equality, which means we need to jettison capitalism and create something, a new economic system, call it socialism, eco-socialism, democratic socialism, so that democracy can finally become more robust. So I think capitalism has to be right there at the center. I think if we ever transcend capitalism, we'll just get more interesting democratic yeah. questions, because finally we won't have to be 
debating this problem of, you know, should billionaires control the wealth in the world? But we'll get to think about how should we actually govern ourselves, which is really tricky. And your, your thoughts about socialism, democratic socialism, what do you think? I mean, a lot of people in, in sort of Cold War America equated socialism and communism with totalitarianism, authoritarianism. I don't, yeah, I, you know, I think that that's, that's a kind of thinking that doesn't resonate with the younger generation, right, who, who doesn't remember the Cold War, um, and who understand that we need the state to play a positive role, to create the conditions of equality that allow people to actually be free. Because if you can't, you know, if you're, if you're in desperate need of medical care, or education, how can you really participate in a democracy? And we have to ask actually, well, what would democratic socialism mean, right? How would we actually um, marry those terms in a, in a productive way? So I think that to me is a source of real excitement and hope that we're having that conversation. Um, and I, again, I think that, you know, just saying, okay, well, we need socialism doesn't answer the question, what is democracy? Right. right. Because there's all, what I try to show in the book that, is that there are all of these paradoxes, all of these tensions that will persist. Even if we lived in an economically egalitarian world, we'd still have to balance the needs of the living with the needs of people who aren't yet born, the needs of a local community with global justice, who the people are, how we rule, that's gonna keep expanding. I imagine a world where the people might expand beyond the human to include animals and nature, the rights of nature. We're seeing signs of this around the world. So I see democracy as something on the horizon perpetually that we're trying to midwife into existence. And that actually excites me. Me too. All right, Astra Taylor, thank you so much. Well, thank you for the book and the movie. You can find links to both and more information about democracy, past, present, and possible at our website. Thanks for watching.